Perfect. So anyway, hopefully you heard that, but yes. So Aaron said, uh, I'm talking to other people about preaching, but could you teach Sunday school? I said, yep, I got Sunday school. The preaching part will leave to other people. <laughs> and uh, his plan was to just check this morning to see if anyone had any questions on uh, church leadership, the, the, the topic that he was talking about. And I'm not going to have Aaron's answers, but if we have questions, let's talk about them. Um, there's no reason not to. And then if we have something we want to ask him, I don't know if he's watching this morning or not, but does anyone have any questions on anything that Aaron talked about up to this point? Questions, comments, anything like that? He's talked about elders uh, of the church. He's talked about uh, uh, the position of deaconess last week. Um, and I wasn't here for the whole, everything that he's done so far, but I actually watched everything online when I wasn't here. So I, I, I saw everything he talked about. I don't know that I remember everything, but any thoughts, any questions? It's easy if you guys don't, because that way I don't have to fight with that. Steve, yes. Um, Stan asks when the Constitution that. Um, Council is proposing will be available for review. You mean available to everyone, like on the, the paper to review? You know, I don't actually know when that's officially going to be available. Ryan, what are your. You would be more on top of that. Can you answer that question? Okay, Ryan said that we're getting through the end, of, we need to get through the, the end of the year, the business meeting and all that, and uh, then after that it'll be another month or so as we really focus on the, the proposed constitution. So does that, do you have anything to add to that, Ryan? No, yeah, that's just, uh, that's the thought with the council right now. Okay, so. good question. I actually didn't know the answer to that one, so that's why we have other people here. Any other questions? If we don't, what I'm going to concentrate on today is, and, and I don't think I'm repeating what Aaron talked about, but if I am, I apologize. You're just going to get another view on, or another perspective on something that he taught on, if I'm wrong on this. Um, he talked on the qualifications and uh, the... Uh, position of the elders, of deaconesses, I'm going to just kind of continue with the position of deacon and uh, again share a little bit different perspective possibly but we'll kind of continue with that. Um, the position of, of the deacon, of a deacon, I sometimes feel that when we um, differentiate between the position of an elder and the position of a deacon, uh, there's, I'd say there's two classes of church leadership there, and it's very easy, uh, and I'm very, very guilty of this. I, um, you, I think of words like servant, which is what deacon means, servant, um, and honestly, many times the Deacon, especially in a secular sense, was a slave uh, back in biblical times. So we kind of take the elder as the overseer, the, the leader of the church, and then the deacon is the lowly deacon. Um, and we have two different positions here, and, and there's a gap between them. And certainly they're different positions, but I want to just take a little bit of time and think about the position of a deacon, not just as a, a 
lowly servant. And certainly there's, there's nothing wrong with being a humble servant. That's, we're, we're called to be humble servants. But let's look at two of the early deacons and just think about them. That would have been Philip and Stephen would have been two of the early deacons. Um, Philip especially kind of stands out to me because Philip was not only a deacon, but he was also, what was Philip's original position? He was called by Jesus to be an apostle. And it was the same Philip who then became a deacon. So you have an apostle who is now a deacon. Well, there's a story in the Bible, in the New Testament, about Philip. What's Philip really known for? The story of Philip in the Bible? Someone knows what I'm talking about? The Ethiopian. He meets the Ethiopian. Okay, the, we sometimes tend to forget, but the um, uh, early church in Africa was very, very strong. And I'm not sure that it's documented extremely well, but it's often thought that the Ethiopian was very influential in taking the church to Africa. Um, and, and so Philip, the deacon, the servant, the slave, if you will, was an evangelist that not only um, explained scripture to the Ethiopian, baptized him, and the man took the message back to Ethiopia. And quite possibly is the reason that the church, the early church in Africa was so strong. So the position of deacon or deaconess, I, I, I'm going to sometimes... Uh, when you look at uh, the offices of the church, it's very easy to say to, to look at it as if, if you're talking an elder, the position of an elder, to say, well, then we have the position of a deacon, and then you, can, you may or may not have the position of a deaconess. I would actually change that a little bit, and I would say it's two positions. Uh, it's a position of the elder, and if you have deaconesses in your church, the, deaconess, the position of deaconess and deacon to me it's a slash. They're the same position. Uh, it just, depending on the circumstances, may be male or female, uh, depending on what that particular deaconess is doing. Um, so, and it's a very minor difference. But sometimes people will say there's the three positions, uh, or the three, yeah, like the three positions. I would view it more as two, because I think the deacon, deaconess, um, position is very interchangeable, even though there are, slight, um, there are slight differences in the qualifications. I'll try to get to those and what those qualifications are, but I think there's reasons for those. I think, and I think you can view those qualifications for deacon slash deaconess. Um, you, you, can, you can process them without separating the position, because I really do think the, the position is in my view, is, is very much the same. It's Actually, it's the same position, in my opinion. But I lost my train of thought. Um, but we're getting back to, trying to get back to where I was, and I totally lost it. Blame it on having COVID. It's not that. I'm just getting old, but whatever. Um, so we have, a, we have a, a, a teacher, and I think that's something that we so easily overlook. For, uh, for the deacons uh, or deaconess, they are to be teachers. Uh, I think it's, it's part of the qualifications, and it's a, it's a high position, in my opinion. Um, it's, again, I, I just want to have you thinking a little differently of, or if you tend to be like me, and you think of the, the, the deacon position as being a position of um, taking care of needs, of, of in some ways just serving. Um, the position of deacon is more than that, in my opinion. We could also look then to Stephen, who um, is, I believe, I may be wrong on this, but I believe he is 
the first recorded martyr in the New Testament in the early church? Am I right about that? So, okay, so Stephen, the, and he was martyred for proclaiming the gospel. Again, a deacon martyred for proclaiming the gospel. Um, another hero of the faith who was one of the, the first deacons. So I, want just, I just want to be careful as we go into this that we give that position the respect it deserves. Um, the, the office of a deacon is is uh, different from the office of the elder, but we want to make sure that we give it the respect it deserves. We'll look at the qualifications of a deacon because they are slightly different from the, the qualifications of a, uh, an elder. And again, we have no PowerPoint today. I, there, was, I just, there was just no way that I had it. I started on one last night, and uh, it, it wasn't going to work. I got tired and had to, had to go to bed. All right, so the uh, qualifications of the deacons. Uh, we can look to Timothy uh, 3, or 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, and Aaron has been, been going through Timothy or has been in 1 Timothy with his qualifications for uh, last week when he was talking about uh, deaconesses. He was, he was in there. Um, so one of the qualifications is that we are to be, that the deacon is to be worthy of respect. The, the, the Greek word that's used for that um, it describes an overarching quality for both men and women. Um, in Timothy 8, uh, 3, 8, 1 Timothy 3, 8, the deacon is to be a man, or, or the deacons are to be men of dignity. And in uh, 3:11, uh, and as far as the women are concerned, they are to be dignified. So dignity, a dignified, worthy of respect. Another qualification is they are to be sincere. There's to be a sincerity, um, demonstrating honesty and integrity in communication. Uh, some Bibles, some translations talk about not being double-tongued, but being, being sincere. This is one, and the, the third qualification is one that we share with, uh, with the elders. Um, Paul's big on this one when it comes to church leadership, not indulging in too much wine. So this is the same basic qualification that Paul required of elders. And when people want to argue that the wine of the, uh, that they talked about in the New Testament was uh, this weak form of grape juice, I'd never, I've never bought into that. Their wine was real wine. It, was, it had a high enough alcohol content to get addicted to it. That's why Paul's worried about it. Um, they had real wine. So, avoiding drunkenness. We don't want to drunk in church leadership. And obviously today we could, it's not saying that in the text, but we could take that to drugs and, and so many other things that we that um, we could be addicted to, especially things that would be mind-altering um, and we'd, we'd need to avoid. Uh, the deacon is not to pursue dishonest gain. So obviously a deacon is a position of uh, uh, a lay position most times. 
and they are to pursue their, their business or their occupation um, honestly, whether they be a farmer, uh, a laborer, whatever they do, a business person, they are to be known for being, being honest. Keeping hold of the deep truth of the faith, faith with a clear conscience. Um, the leaders emerging in the New Testament churches who used biblical truth to pursue dishonest gain, uh, manipulating people to give money that was used selfishly, um, that was considered... Paul was probably considering that when, when he talked about uh, keeping hold of the deep truth of the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up here. Um, Paul probably zeroed in on this requirement in a specific way for deacons because they were often entrusted with the task of handling money in the church. Um, so avoiding dishonest gain, they were to be, again, trustworthy with handling the churches, whether it be the money or other material um, supplies the office of deacon would, in some ways, entail what we, our trustees, do now. Um, we'd probably think of the office of deacon, the deacons many times doing what our trustees are doing today. They're handling the material things of the church. Um, not so much, in our case, the money, but certainly, certainly supplies in the church. Um, they can't just grab a lawnmower and take home and mow their their own grass if it's a church's lawnmower, that sort of thing. Keeping hold of the deep truth of the faith faith with a clear conscience. A deacon is to... The deacon does have have a a, um, real responsibility to... Know the faith and to keep the true faith and to live that way. Again, I think sometimes we, we forget that the deacon is to be, to be a, a teacher, almost a teacher. He, he needs to have that, that ability to teach just the way that the elder does. And they must first be tested. And if we remember, the elder is to be tested too. Now, the interesting thing about the test is that Paul never gives any indication as to how we are to test our elders or our deacons. Um, and I am not sure what the Constitution, the new con- proposed Constitution, has as far as the test, as, as how we will handle that. But that is a very biblical thing. We are to test those who we are to, who are going to be put in either a deacon or elder position. Uh, Paul does not mention in verse 10 any particular method of conduct, conducting this test, which once again introduces us to a, they talk about a freedom in form. In other words, it's up to the church to decide how they're going to figure out if someone's qualified to be a deacon or an elder because Paul does not give any, any indication as to what that should be. Um, and now we get into not being a malicious talker. This part, and if you remember from Aaron talking last Sunday, appears to be aimed more to the deaconesses. Um, if we were to separate, again, I, talked, I, I like to view the office of deacon and deaconess as very much the same, but here's the differentiating factor. Um, the New Testament appears to address the men who are to be deacons a little differently from the women who are to be deaconesses in that the men are very much addressed, their, their, their character is very much pointed to as we need to be pure in thought, especially 
guarding ourselves against sexual um, sexual immorality, uh, and we'll get into the like the deacon is to be the husband of one wife, um, those sorts of things. So if I were to say there's, there, there's a difference in the requirement for the men and the women uh, in the way they're ad- the, the, the requirements are addressed, it's that the men are to guard against sexual immorality, the ladies, according to Paul, to watch their tongue. I'm a little nervous when I say that because I, when I say that, I think back on those times that I said things I shouldn't have said. So it puts me in a little bit of a weird position to say that here, but I am going to lay that in directly in Paul's lap and say, discuss that with Paul. Yes, I've said some things that I very much regret. Um, I tend to do that sometimes, and I am not... I know I'm not the only guy here because I do sometimes think a, a little bit before I say something, and I still say things I shouldn't say. Um, but ladies, watch your tongue. Men, you probably should do it too, even though Paul's addressing the ladies, in my opinion, in this one. And the interesting thing about the qualifications of, and I don't care if it's the elder or the deacon, if you're a Christian sitting in this church today, never were an elder, never were a deacon, never were a deaconess, never intend to be one, never will be one, you should probably still be meeting each and every one of these qualifications. It's an interesting thing when you think about it. As Christians, we should model each and every one of these qualifications in our daily life regardless. And if we have a church of people who do, there should be no shortage of people who are available for the offices of the church. And what a church we have if we have people who are uh, following these requirements, as we should. Now, um, this one, the, the one, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but the whole issue of malicious talking There are some people who feel that this may have been, to a degree, a cultural issue. I don't know that. It's very hard trying to get the, the, to totally understand a culture that is so foreign and so far in the past from your own. There's there's certain things that we can go back and understand New Testament culture, certain things that we can kind of get And there are certain nuances that we don't quite get. And we don't really know what the average ordinary life of the average ordinary Christian sitting in the pews was back then. We really don't know. Uh, And it's very hard for us to, to try to understand that because everything that we do, we filter through what we experience today. So it's really hard to, to get that. Um, so there's some, some people feel that this qualification really has a kind of a cultural context to it. I think it's a truth, whether it's, there's a cultural context to it or not, we, we should be watching our, our tongue. There's plenty of other scriptures that talk about that as well. Another qualification is to be temperate. Um, this characteristic is... Uh, also outlined for the elders. Um, if we look to the Greek word, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, um, it basically means that a person is to have a clear focus on, on life, is what the, the, uh, the author of the, the book that I'm using for the as I'm going through it, he's describing, he's saying it's, it's to have a, a clear focus, to not be kind of all over the place, but to have a, a focus on, on your life and, and kind of move forward with, with, the, with an actual focus. Um, Trustworthiness. We we have the quality of being trustworthy. Greek word, I'll butcher it, but pistos, pistos, whatever, however it's pronounced. Um, 
can be translated to trustworthy or faithfulness. Um, this one appears to be especially aimed toward deaconesses again, and uh, it would be a woman who exhibits the quality of trustworthiness in everything. And obviously, this is uh, true of men as well, but Paul doesn't necessarily emphasize it for the deacons for some reason, and we don't know why. And then he goes back to talking about the men. Um, here we have the husband of one wife. So we could view that as, once again, returning to the idea of moral purity. Again, the deacons are to manage their children and household well. This is one that we come across several times in Scripture. And it seems that Paul especially was used the, the, how, the managing the household as a kind of an indicator or a test, if you will, of how a person will manage a position in the church. Um, maybe it was just an easy, maybe it's an easy way of doing it, I don't know. But it appears that Paul felt that if someone was a, a, a bad manager at home, that they would do the same in the church. And it's probably, he's probably right on about that because we are who we are. If, we, if we're not good managing one area of our life, are we, are we inconsistent and all of a sudden great at managing another area of our life? I really think that's, that it probably is a great example. You, you look at a position a person is in, a, a husband, a father, or a mother, or a wife. Do they do that well? And if they do, then they will probably have the other areas of their life in order as well. And if they... Today, if, if I were to equate it to something today, I would say, and, and not everyone owns or runs some sort of a business, but if someone is running a business and doing a great job of it, I would think of them as probably taking a position in an organization and doing that well if they have an example of the business that they're running well or if they're a manager in a company. If they, if they manage their department well, they would probably manage a position in the church well. That's kind of what Paul is doing here. He's looking at, um, at, at an area of their life and saying, if you do that well, that would be a qualification to take this position. Now... It's interesting that I was asked to teach on the positions of church leadership because especially for those who are uh, deacons in here or on, the, on church council know that over a year ago when we really started talking about the new constitution, I was one who really was dragging my feet about changing from a constitutional or a, a congregationally run church to an elder run church. Um, and it was pointed out to me by a number of people that the elder run church is the New Testament model of the church. And it is. That did not mean much to me for one very simple reason. The New Testament church was a church that... Um, I can't imagine how it could have been elder run. Many times there were uh, new converts in, in the Greek-speaking areas, of the Greek areas. They didn't even, they were brand new Christians, no idea how to manage a church, what e Christianity even really entailed. So they um, had to be an elder run church. They had to bring the elders in to run the church. And to this day, I have no issue with a congregationally run church. I don't think it's anti-biblical to have a congregationally run church. Um, I still am a little bit partial to that, but I really have changed my views on this in the last 
within the past year. Um, and maybe that's why I was asked to teach about it this morning. The reason that I have, a couple of reasons that I, that I uh, changed my view about it is, um, I think a properly elder-run church helps ensure against something that we may have experienced here in the past, um, could be more recent, could be in the di more distant past, something that a, a congregationally run church can easily fall prey to. And that is that we can be, almost become a cult of personality if you get the right pastor or the right leader in place. The church gr really grows because that leader is in place. A properly structured, congregationally run church means that you have a number of elders in place and they will actually um, protect against that, if you will, because it's not one person in charge of the church, one person that everybody is looking to as, as the person that they think of when they think of whatever particular church it is. So I really thought about that and... Uh, This, I would not have said a year ago, but I think we need to do the new constitution. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be teaching on it. Um, and I was one who was dragging my feet about it. I'm not, I'm not understanding why we need to change everything. Um, so I guess we're getting toward the end here. Any, does anyone have any thoughts on that part of it? Any any. Any questions on, and, and I am certainly not the one with all the answers on this, but I have been part of church council during this whole time that we've talked about um, the new constitution. Do you have thoughts or questions on that? There's, there certainly is that. The one thing I think is very important, and I made this, this was part of my issue, is um, I viewed a congregationally run church as a check and a balance to, to council. Council decides to do something, well, we have to go back to the congregation and get approval. If it was anything of any magnitude, we had to go to the, co the congregation and get approval. Now, that's a little, our church, we don't get approval for every little thing we do, but big things we had to get approval for. But I think that's been, and I don't have the constitution in front of me, the, new con the proposed constitution in front of me, but I think that has been adequately addressed in there, that there are still checks and balances. And Bob, what you just said, by having a plurality of leaders, you've got just almost built-in stability by doing that. Um, it's not one or two people who get to go in whatever direction or be unaccountable. There's, there is a built-in accountability and a built-in almost a, a stabilizing effect by having enough people there to, to keep from going with that ebb and flow or whatever somebody decides, that, whatever direction somebody decides to charge off into. So I wasn't actually sure about that in the beginning. I honestly thought it might be easier to go off the rails somewhere, but I think we've, I think it's been well set up in the new constitution. Steve, yes. If the position of elder would be, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about it, would the deacon's position then be eliminated? In the new constitution? Yes. No. We would... Absolutely. And then will you have a description of what their responsibility Absolutely. Is? Absolutely. Well, as I've been hearing it, it kind of is running neck and neck. Uh, what, what is the actual difference of the responsibilities of a the versus an elder? Perfect question. That's a great question. I'm not questioning that this isn't right, but I'd just like to know the difference. Yep. Nope, that is a great question. And we'd still have time left. Good. 
So I am going to give you some of my thoughts. Ryan's here. I'm going to ask him to share some of his thoughts on it because I don't have all the answers on this one. But the, the position of the elder is to be... An elder is an interesting word because, honestly, if you look at the context of it, it does actually kind of mean old man. <laughs> like, there is an element of that there. Thank so <laughs> there is supposed to be a maturity there with the elder. The maturity as in... And it doesn't, I don't think that means that a young man can't be an elder, but honestly, there needs to be a, a maturity in the faith with the elder. Uh, and, and the Constitution doesn't, I think, address any age group, so don't get me wrong on that, but I'm just saying there needs to be, they are to be the, um, the they're, they're to be a leader in the faith. They're to be, they're to guard against heresy. They are to, to, to be, they're almost to be there right alongside the pastor and serve as the spiritual leadership of the church. Okay, then that's what the deacon was in the past. That is correct. Okay. Elra, you're exactly right. They dealt with church discipline, which would be what the elder will do, still do. In other words, then the elders would take this position. Absolutely. You are correct. Well, do we, or do we need the deacons? Do we need those, do we need, okay, deacons, in the early church, the position of elder was a given. You had to have the elder. The deacons were not necessarily a given in the early church. They were brought on as the situation demanded it. Remember the first deacons were when the, um, the Greek widows were being overlooked. So we had a situation. Someone needed to take care of a segment of the church. Now, we certainly have segments of this church that need to have someone take care of them. That would be the deacon's position. They take care of the maintenance. But we have needs in the church that the deacons would be taking care of. And I don't know what the details of the, 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 the job description in the proposed constitution are for the deacons. So, Ryan, do you, do you have anything to add to that, to what I just said? Um, I guess largely the... Basically, it's looked at, as you already said earlier, as the deacon being the servant. So it's um, a relabeling, I guess, of what, like the, our current definition for deacon, like in our constitution that we have now, is more on, I'm talking about deacon right now, but that's more on the lines of what we see biblically is what an elder is. So the, the new deacons, is, and largely what you're explaining here, is more just simply the servants of carrying out the ministry, but not necessarily involved in the, the spiritual part as much. Honestly, I don't feel that our current deacons actually do deacon work as far as a biblical description of a deacon. I think we, if we do nothing else, we should take our deacons now and name them elders. And we'd be much more in line of what the biblical description of, an, of their position, of their, their position is that of an elder. I kind of agree with that. Yeah, it, it very much is. So if we did nothing else, we would be more biblical if we renamed their position from a deacon to that of an elder. And we do have deacons in this church, in my opinion. We have people who are heading up serving ministries. We, we call them whatever, it, it, whatever we call them, but we don't, certainly don't use the word deacon or deaconess, but there are people who are in charge of the kitchen or the, the, the kitchen ministry or the taking care of making meals, the meal ministries and stuff like that. All that is deacon and deaconess work. My point this morning, one of the points this morning was, though, that we don't want to just say, well, it's a position of just absolutely serving. We, we need to make sure that our deacon and deaconesses, if we have the deaconess, are also um, grounded spiritually, are able to lead and teach and represent us, represent God and represent Jesus in a, a biblical manner. Um, there's, there's a qualification there for them to do that. It's not just, oh, well, they're just serving meals. They don't, 
If their spiritual life is a mess, that's okay. That can't be. We, we should all meet the qualifications. All of us should be living a life with those qualifications as an elder or deacon or whatever you want to call it. I absolutely believe that. Where I fall short in any of those qualifications, I fall short as a Christian just as surely as I would if I were asked to be a, an elder or a deacon. So. so I wanted to say a little bit too. You, someone had asked a question earlier about, um, you know, if we had the Constitution available and stuff. So it might seem a little bit cart in front, of, in front of the horse as far as how we're doing this, but the emphasis on what this past month has been with Sunday school here has been basically looking at the what is often referred to as the timeless principles that we find in the Bible and in the New Testament on God's design for how the church is to be ran with biblical leadership. So that's what we've been trying to put focus on here. And then what we will be doing um, is then fleshing out their constitution as far as how we apply those timeless principles here at Richfield Life. And so that's what we're, that's what we're gonna be transitioning towards. But largely too, just as I was listening to Dean explain all that. Um, so for the most part now, for everyone that a lot of you have served in the leadership in the past and many of you haven't, but for the most part, we function as, so our congregation makes big decisions at the meeting each year and, and on occasion as needed. Um, but then much of the smaller decisions are delegated to our church council. So it's, it's going to be very similar after the new constitution. It's simply, um, not simply, but it, much of why we're leaning this way is to bring more clarity to what exactly we're asking of the elders, more clarity to what are exactly we're asking of the people that serve. Um, but by and large, there's still going to be um, very similar decisions that'll be made by the congregation with the new constitution. It's just some of the specific, um, more detailed authority is delegated to the, the elders with the new constitution. Um, is there anything? No, that was a good. Just trying to give a little bit more context and mm -hmm. background there towards um, what the new, you know, basically what the new process would be. It's not, it's not actually going to be, on paper it looks a little different, but I think in function it's not going to be too much different from what we already do. It's just bringing clarity to how we go about doing things. And it's, it's I, I would speak, I believe, on behalf of everybody in leadership, it's clarity is needed around here for, for us to be able to function. So. And I think it does, it's, it, to go along with that, it would streamline some of the decision-making process. And I guess one of my fears originally was that it becomes too streamlined, it becomes too easy. And I think we need to guard against that. We need to make it so that I'm a big, I'm a conservative in, in so many ways. I, I, I will never run a huge company because I can't react quick enough to, to, to do something like that. I'm always one to hold back just a little bit and say, yeah, let's slow down just a little bit. I believe in, in decisive action, but I like to have a little bit of time to process before I make decisive action or take decisive action. Um, and that was part of my thing was, let's make sure that we're not running off in various directions right away. Let's slow down just a little bit. I'm confident that the Constitution does that, that it has met that, that concern that I had, that the accountability, the checks and balances, the, the just that little bit of let's, let's slow down a little bit. We don't need, if, if I, I'm someday, uh, whether I, I'm in church leadership or just sitting in the pews with my family uh, as just a, a normal person coming to church. Um, I want to trust that, that we're making solid decisions, and, and I really do think we're, we'll do it with this Constitution. I do think the Constitution will function better for a larger church. Now, I'm not sure, we're running out of time here, but I am not sure... You know, right now is a really tough time to know how large our church is. And we talk about that during council meetings sometimes. Like, this whole COVID thing has messed everything up. When it's over, and we will get over it, I'm convinced of that, 
how large is our church really at that point as far as, because we very much go by attendees, not so much members, but attendees. It's so hard to know right now, but we're, we're about to find out. I truly think we're going to be over the hump. Hopefully sometime in 2021, we'll, we'll get to the other side of this and we'll see where we are. Um, but everything works in God's timing. Um, this has been a long process, but I guess at the end of it all, uh, I am in favor of the new constitution, which is something I was not at one time. I think we're, it's a good thing, and uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about it. I think it will help a, church, a larger church function well if we go in that route. So anyway, Ryan, do you have anything else before I just offer a quick prayer and we... Uh, just real quick, I know Aaron mentioned this, but by you know, kind of looking at what could help things facilitate it better, uh, basically by how we could maybe operate to be in line with God's design for the church and to operate um, in a biblical way, that again, as Aaron mentioned, that doesn't mean that we haven't done this in the past. It just means that as we're learning, as we're growing, um, you know, taking note of these things and seeking the Lord's guidance on it, and that's what what we've been trying to let steer us. Um, but the, just the other quick side note, and then I'll let Dean pray, pray us out here. But, you know, so the one of the things, too, to go along with delegating a little bit, um, delegating more responsibility to the elders and what's coming, um, one of the other things is also having a more extensive process for the elders to be an elder, to get in the door. Um, whereas now, you know, Basically, you have a vote, but there's not much of a process of what do, you, what do you actually go through? What are the steps that you go through to work with this people to give the ability for feedback from others for, for that type of thing? So that's that's um, one of the things also that I think is important to, to understand. And again, we'll get into all that when we go through the new constitution stuff, but so that should be it. Perfect. All right. We, I'd love to continue the discussion, but we do need to, to, uh, to move on. Lord. I just thank you for everyone who's here today. Um, I, I am so thankful to be able on a Sunday morning to come here to, to talk through things like we did today, to, to learn, to worship with the men and women who are here this morning. Um, I am just so thankful for them. Lord, I just, I just once again, thank you for letting me be part of this, this body uh, may we be a body that is, is doing our best to seek after you and just to, to grow in our faith and in our, in our, what we know of you and just how we serve you uh, week by week, Lord. I pray for those who are dealing with uh, COVID this morning or are, suspect they may be dealing with COVID. Um, right now we have, I believe, Joel still at home and uh, Aaron obviously is at home. I don't know that, I don't believe he's been tested yet, but... Lord, there's so much of this going around, not just in, with our pastors, but so many of our congregation has been through it and is, is in the process of going through it. I pray for them, Lord. I pray for their health. I pray for those who have lost a loved one to, um, well, whether it be to COVID or to whatever reason, it just seems there's a number of, of people that I know have passed away recently, Lord, or people that, that I know have lost someone recently. I pray for them. Um, it's a difficult time. I pray for those who are just uh, thinking of someone in particular right now, but the name doesn't really matter. People in the neighborhood who are dealing with those health issues and uh, maybe in the hospital and that are just going to the doctor, trying to figure out what the next step is. I pray for those um, healthcare workers who are dealing with just so many people uh, in the ICU right now and uh, those who are concerned about the, the capacity of the ICUs and and uh, how they will deal with, with it, how they decide who, um, who to admit and who to send home. Lord, there's just so much going on right now, but we do know that you're in control. Um, there's 